Hey team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War uh, News Update, second part there after the 3rd of May 2024. Whenever I want to say, I know what I want to say, and my brain just says, oh, I'm going to say something else instead, and you get it wrong. I told you before, I've got twin boys, and I know what each of them are called, obviously, but as soon as I want to say, hey, Finn, come here, uh, my brain goes, you want to say Finn? You're going to say Oscar instead. Hey, Oscar, oh, oh. 13 years of speaking to you and I still call you the wrong name because not because I don't know it not because I'm confused it's just my brain is a bastard anyway enough nonsense let's get on to the military aid and military equipment segment and it's an interesting one today predominantly because the UK has made some big announcements David Cameron is presently in Kiev the UK foreign minister former prime minister He's committed three billion a year to uh, in aid to Ukraine, quote for as long as necessary. So, um, the UK has promised three billion pounds a year for as long as is necessary to help Ukraine. David Cameron uh, said on Thursday as he made the second visit to Kiev since becoming UK Foreign Secretary. That is about three point seven four billion dollars, I believe, to give you an idea. Um, so he said Ukraine has a right to strike inside Russia because Russia is striking inside Ukraine. You can understand why Ukraine feels the need to defend itself. We've just emptied all we can in terms of giving equipment so that some of the equipment is actually arriving in Ukraine today while I am here. So this is a classic case of telling the world what has been given to Ukraine as it arrives in Ukraine, not a case of uh, we're going to give you this and you'll get it in a couple of months time, although that will happen too with certain pieces of equipment. Um, so Cameron said the UK would bring international partners together next month to attract additional contributions to the International Fund for Ukraine to meet Ukraine's urgent capability requirements. The Foreign Secretary also confirmed 36 million package for Ukraine's energy infrastructure and investment in future innovations to support Ukraine's energy transition and recovery. Cameron said, quote, Ukraine is fiercely defending itself against Russia's illegal invasion, making a war Putin thought would last days take years, but this war is a challenge of our generation and Ukraine cannot fight it alone. We must all step up to ensure Ukraine has what it needs to win through our multi-year military funding, weapons provision and vital support to protect and repair Ukraine's energy infrastructure. The UK is standing with Ukraine and we will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Cameron has ruled out sending British troops to Ukraine, but in an interview with The Economist, the French President Emmanuel Macron maintained his stance of strategic ambiguity, saying I'm not ruling anything out because we are facing someone who is not ruling anything out. We have undoubtedly been too hesitant by defining the limits of our action to someone who no longer has any and who is the aggressor. Our capacity is to be credible, to continue to help to give Ukraine a means to resist, but our credibility also depends on a capacity to deter by not giving full visibility as to what we will do and what we will not do. Otherwise, we will weaken ourselves. If the Conservatives are not re-elected, re a Labour government would either have to adopt Cameron's spending commitment or renounce it. That's interesting. So Cameron's made a big, bold decision, which I think is $3 billion of military assistance and stuff like energy infrastructure rebuilding is on top of that. That's how I understand it. Right. Um, and if that's the case, this is really significant funding because it's also going forward. Now, Labour will get in in November or whenever the election is called. Soon that's getting an absolute spanking in the local elections. The Conservatives are getting a spanking in the local elections. There are some interesting things with regard to the UK elections in terms of how Gaza is informing many of the Muslim um, communities in the UK and they are voting against Labour because Labour have been quite strong, although they have they have changed over time, but initially very strong on supporting Israel. So there's an interesting set of issues within local elections, but the the real end result is that the the Conservatives will not win the the general election, certainly on the basis of how this has gone. And this is always a good predictor of a general election, what happens in the May local elections beforehand. So Labour will get in. Will they continue this? I assume they will. They've said absolutely nothing that would go against this. Uh, U UK's Ukraine policy has generally been agreed on a broadly bipartisan basis, but it is not known if this multi-year pledge to continue arming Ukraine's military for as long as it takes was cleared with the Labour leader uh, Keir Starmer in advance. So we will see, but I'm, I, I think that will be continued. And uh, it's interesting, Elliot Cohen of the CSIS 
on Ukraine the latest the other day uh, ended with, by the way, 2.5% of GDP is not enough for the UK, like, and, and therefore everyone really. I mean, we are moving to needing 3% plus uh, of GDP spent on defence in light of what Russia is doing. But this is really good. So this is apparently including things like storm shadows and air, air defence missiles as well. I don't know what they are because we don't have things like Patriots. Uh, so it might be things like ASRAMs for the Supercat ASRAM launcher that we are providing. It could be it could be Starstreak and, and Martlets and whatnot for man portable air defence systems, shoulder launch ones or Brimstone or stuff on the back of uh, trucks or whatever. There, there's no detail there yet. But this is exactly what Ukraine will need. And the idea that it goes on past this year is really good. Now, uh, like I said earlier, you may think, well, three billion pounds isn't that much compared to 61 billion from the US. So let's put it into context. And I'm not either denigrating the US or trying to big up UK, but I'm trying to get a comparability here. So uh, 3.74 billion o over a, a year, if we, if we assume that, well, the UK is a seventh of the size of the US in terms of GDP, a fifth the size in terms of population. And you can slice and dice it either way, but let's take GDP. So let's multiply that that almost $4 billion by seven, and you get, say, $25 billion. So that's about $25 billion worth of military equipment. Now, if I understand that correctly, that is just military equipment. So when you look at the US package of $61 billion, we talked about this the other day, that is somewhere between 20 and 25 billion dollars worth of equipment um depending on how how you work that out but that that therefore is somewhat comparable to the UK the UK is comparable to the US and actually we promise that kind of every year whereas there there are thoughts that are at the end of this year there will be no more US aid depending on what happens politically so this is really good news, but of course, in terms of being the size of the US, we are not. And as, as mentioned, we have exhausted our stocks. So we need to ramp up our defense military industrial complex. And we also need to be considering buying lots of stuff and ordering lots of stuff now going forward, not just for ourselves, but for Ukraine on an ongoing basis. But we even, given that we have given a comparable amount of stuff as the, to the US, Ukraine absolutely need the US because the US is a much bigger country in terms of geography, population and GDP and military stocks. All those things mean that the US is still the most important component of foreign military aid to Ukraine. So this is really good from the UK uh, and this is this is definitely welcome. But, you know, that needs to be replicated throughout Europe in terms of, yeah, there are nations that are given more than that. So, again... Germany, and we can look at GDP and populations and whatnot, but Germany have given more. I mean, they've doubled what we've given in terms of military aid uh, in total, um, although th th this looks like we've, we've then topped our, ours up a little bit. But um, either way, Germany have done a really good job, but we need all nations to be doing that and then putting things in place to continue it uh, on a sustainable basis. Now, good news is that the EU and some of the Nordic states have done that. So Norway, I think, put in place a five-year plan that's exactly what Ukraine needs so that they have sustainable assistance from uh, allied nations. Um, anyway, good good news there. Um, he, let's have a look. If they're, yeah, Storm Shadow Long Range Cruise Missiles uh, shouldn't be limited. Yeah, so anyway, moving on, we're now going to another good bit of news for the Ukrainians, which is that according to La Repubblica, Italian news source, the Italians are to give a SAMTI system in a new aid package worth, I think, quite a bit of uh, money. Is it, have I seen it quoted as like a, is it a billion or something? I don't know. But anyway, uh, I'll have to look at that elsewhere. This is really good news because this is possibly comparable to the Patriot Pac-3 system that can shoot down ballistic missiles. I don't know if it's definitely got the capability of the Patriot, but it can shoot down ballistic missiles. And they are working on an update to the Sancti as well. Uh, but obviously that's much further down the line. So the Italian government is readying a new defense aid package for Ukraine that would include, among other things, Sancti. Also potentially Stinger, a surface-to-air missiles, which is really useful, man pads, or missiles that can go in things like the Avenger, which is they've, the man pad is the man portable air defense system, the Stinger, which is an old bit of kit 
goes on the shoulder, fires at airplanes that got about a five kilometer or whatever range. And they've also got those on the back of um, of Humvees, and I think they have two pods of four on the back. Uh, so those missiles are what are in short supply. We we know we've seen say Chaziv Yar where you've got close air support from the Russians flying planes above Chaziv Yar with impunity. All you need is a couple of stingers there, and they had loads of those at the beginning of the war, but obviously have exhausted those supplies. Although. I'd be thinking, goodness me, there must be some stingers around the whole of Ukraine. And as soon as I saw a day where they were flying over, over Chazy VR with impunity, I'd be, get those stingers wherever they are, get some to Chazy VR. Absolutely cannot have planes operating above the contact line, pretty much, or, or at least close enough to it. Good news there, anyway. Uh, Samuel Bender here says the 10th group now trains hundreds of Ukrainians a month. Some receive highly specialized training, learning to operate drones, to shoot them down or to use other equipment. Uh, other groups learn to attack targets selected by Ukrainian special forces. This is how U.S. special operators are training Ukrainians and what they're learning in return uh, from Defense One here. Quotes, the more uh, disciplined Ukrainian units had better training results while those with less qualified commanders had trouble. One unit was out every morning doing physical training on their own and did it well. Another unit was put together at the last minute and didn't proceed as far. Uh, among Van Antwerp's top priorities are drones and counter drone equipment, both key features of the war in Ukraine. He also cited more niche but increasingly discussed topics such as battlefield deception for example st simulating and army formations to draw an enemy's attention away from the real units among the chief lessons he's taken from ukraine this is american trainers though is a speed at which innovation must occur weapons used in ukraine must make a big impact on the first day they're used he said by day two russia will be working on a countermeasure this is so important i mean i guess ever has it ever has it been the case in war but this is a this is just a, a much longer war than people were maybe expecting or some people were expecting even Zelensky himself and there are there is such a movement in terms of technology that there is the demand for counter measures and then the demand for counter counter measures and finding the loopholes or or innovating your way out out of being hit by those counter measures so there's this arms race going on that is so dynamic uh, and both sides trying to get this kind of one-upmanship uh, and that is what we are learning by looking at this is how quickly you need to to innovate in a very technological war where you're talking about electronic warfare um, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, apparently the US has surged ATAC and production. There's a little bit of discussion about actually whether this is happening and what 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 really is going on here but anyway uh, us has surged atacum's production no longer concerned about sending missiles to ukraine army acquisition chief doug bush has said today quite a significant number of missiles that were ordered years ago are now hitting at just the right time i uh, i don't know if that means they're surging now like they were ordered a couple of years ago so yeah colby badwa says assistant secretary of the army for acquisition doug bush confirms what GDOTS told VOA Voice of America last month, they are producing 36,155 mil shell bodies per month. Production will increase significantly when their new plant in Texas opens in summer. So this is the shell production uh, going up in the US and they are going to be using some a lot of that funding that's come in that last military aid package to ramp up production in the US. That will help obviously the US and of course Ukraine. Uh, interesting likely conclusion about the UK M270B1s from Ukraine is their air fire control system seems to have retained the ability to employ M39, M39A1 ATACMs. In other words, we have, the UK has provided some multiple launch rocket systems, the M270B1s. So remember, the HIMARS is a guided multiple launch rocket system on wheels, but then Ukraine has a bunch of tracked ones, but they can fire the same things evidently so this is saying that the uk provided m270 b1 that has well not with atacums but with regard to normal missiles they they would fire in pods of 12 and high mass fire in pods of six uh, but obviously they can't drive as fast and they're on track so you know pros and cons french german italian liu or mars 2 or uh, multiple launch rocket systems should have m39 39a1 disabled by EFCS is that European fire control system I don't know so the UK M270B1s are the candidates for the Jankoy raid in other words 
it appears that the ATACMs are actually being used not just on HIMARS, but on other guided multiple launch rocket systems, particularly, I mean, the the main culprit appears to be the British provided version because it looks like the German and French provided versions ha are disabled from sending ATACMs. Um, anyway, just thought I'd add that one in. Um, Quote, it is out of the question for us to export our S-400 systems to any country, says the Turkish Defense Minister Yazagula. In an interview previously, the US asked Turkey to transfer the S-400 air defense systems to Ukraine. That can now be ruled out. The same as asked of Greece, and of course they ruled that out. And that's because Turkey and Greece are aiming those things at each other. And that's why they don't want to give them away. One side gives them away, it gives the other the advantage. And re in reality, it'd be great if both sides could just agree to give their S-400s to Ukraine. Hence, so, uh, so German military concern has contracted to deliver six additional TRML-4D air surveillance radars to Ukraine. This is, we've already known this, a contract is worth over 100 million euros and will be fulfilled this in full this year. Although it's not yet known who placed the order with Hensolt, I would like to point out that it's most likely the German government. I'm already on it. In addition, says German aid to Ukraine, to the Iris TSLM systems in which the TRML-4D is an essential component, Germany has already delivered eight TRML-4Ds to Ukraine in 2023. Just a few days ago, the German government announced the delivery of a further TRML-4D the air surveillance radar to Ukraine, which would mean that one of the six radars now ordered has already been delivered. The TRL M four D ML is capable of tracking one thousand five hundred targets within a radius of up to two hundred fifty kilometers. The video attached to this tw tweet shows Ukrainian soldiers operating the system. So that's really good news. Uh, I update a spokesperson for Hensolt confirmed to me that the contract for the six. TRML-4D was concluded with the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense and is paid for by the German government. Ordered by the, the Ukrainians, which means that it's something the Ukrainians wanted rather than something the Germans thought the Ukrainians would want. That's how I'd interpret that. So the, the Ukrainians get to order stuff and then the Germans say we'll pay for that. I don't know whether there's a, a kickback for, for Germany in or for Ukraine to somehow in ordering yeah, it's more likely the Germans are going to want Ukraine to order stuff from Germany. So, yeah, we'll pay for this. And it's like, okay, we'll order these this stuff from the US. It's like, yeah, not so much. So I don't know what agreement goes on there, but it's Ukraine appear to want them and Germany are paying for them. And that's how they're getting those. And they are already on the way. One has been delivered on top of previous ones that have been delivered. So Anton Gerashenko has said, I meant to report this a couple of days ago, just complete, I don't know where the tweet went. Sometimes links disappear as I copy and paste things and it all goes wrong. Anyway, uh, on the night of April the 30th, left-wing activists burned a building in northern Germany. It belonged to Armin Papager, the CEO of Rheinmetall, the fifth largest arms company in Europe. So he's a guy who's so important in the support of Ukraine. Yes, his company's doing well out of it, but he is really striving to get as much stuff to Ukraine as possible and also working to do get stuff from abroad, from other countries. You know, he was involved and his company was involved in trying to get uh, Gepard ammunition from uh, Switzerland. And when that didn't come, he then started the manufacturing line, production line for that uh, so anyway, he's doing, a, I, I think, a fantastic job to support Ukraine. Built reports that it was done by radical left activists. A statement released by activists said that Rheinmetall is profiting from arms supplies to Ukraine. I, and I get this. I used to be an anti-military industrial complex sort of person about there is no profit in war, uh, profit in peace, sorry. And it is all about profiting. But if you're going to do war, which humans are going to do, then you are going to have people that are going to produce that equipment. Now, either the state just decides to do that entirely, but actually that's often not the most efficient or the best way of getting the best kit out there. You kind of need the state doing certain things and you need the the, uh, the free market doing certain things. And if the free market are going to be involved, they are only going to do that if they are going to make a profit. So the question is, are they profiteering or are they just making profit in line with what other companies do in making anything that the government uses? So whether that is, I don't know, food for the NHS or whether that is, uh, you know, whatever it is, right? If, if the government is is needing things, either you have the state controlling everything and making everything and that then we have communism, uh, broadly speaking, some kind of central strategic planning, or you have the free market doing stuff, and that will include weapons of war. 
Right, well, the weapons of war are not any different from any other good, if you like, or the product, I mean, um, in, in many respects. And so, yes, they are going to be making profit during times of war. And they are going to be profiting from this war. But in the same way that people providing medical equipment are profiting, but you don't go to medical suppliers and say, oh, look at you, you just want war. Oh, look at you with your gauzes and your bandages and your Cat 7, you know, tourniquets and, and IFACs. Like, no one has a go at them because you're saving lives. But it's because these are weapons of war that people treat them with, with much more cynicism. But actually, like, like if you are going to do war, then you're going to want to do it as good as possible. So in the unlikely, you know, we are not going to have a pacifistic world, unfortunately, going forward. Because humans are bastards and we do terrible things. That's why we need to get together in alliances and that's why the geopolitics needs to work. But when that fails, war needs to be done as efficiently as possible and as precisely as possible so there isn't the collateral damage that we're seeing in these cities of Ukraine. And the free market can help with doing that. And it can help with the innovation. So, like, at one time in my life, I might have looked at that and gone, mm, okay, yeah, I can kind of get that. Now I'm like, you're not helping. Because the big picture here is Ukraine must must win for the kind of world that we all want to exist. Unless you want to live in a Russian autocracy where you have no freedom, fair enough, you go for that. You burn down his house. Otherwise, you're being a bit of a douche. Uh, according to them, the company is now stocking up an, on old armoured vehicles which can be sold to Ukraine along with ammunition and make a significant profit. Okay, well, fair enough. You, if if you're arguing the state should buy them and then sell them at no profit, fair enough. That's okay. That's an interesting idea. Uh, but if you're saying they shouldn't get to Ukraine at all, that's not cool. I think a Russian trace should be definitely uh, should definitely be looked for here, either among those who ordered this and maybe among the performers too. Says Anton Gerashchenko. Um, today is Good Friday. A solemn day commemorating Jesus' crucifixion. Now, I'm a, <laughs> I'm an atheist philosopher who has written a book on the crucifixion and how it's not historically viable. Um, that aside, why I've got this here is because uh, the other day the the Ukrainians announced that they'll get, get be getting planes F-16s after Easter, and lots of people kind of rightfully said Easter's been and gone. I was like, oh yeah. But actually, this appears to be maybe a different Easter date for Orthodox Christianity, uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, such as the Russian and Ukrainian church. So I don't know. It's observed as a strict fast with no meat or dairy allowed. No manual labor is done and conversations are quiet. Uh, services include veneration of the Holy Shroud depicting Christ's wounded body lying in repose. So there you go. It, it, it may well be Holy Friday today. And that means that you could see F-16s on the way. Any time after now, but as I said yesterday, of course, that means uh, after Easter just means any time from now until the end of time. Uh, a significant amount of work is being carried out to adapt AASM hammer bombs. These are the, I think, 250 kilogram guided glide bombs that the French manufacture. And the fact that they are being adapted to the F-16s that Ukraine are going to get is great uh, because they are getting 50 of these per month, up to 600 over the year, hopefully beyond that as well. They are using these for quite effectively. They just need like more of them, but it's possibly not the more bombs they need, although they need that, but it's the airframe. So at the moment, the Ukrainians have such limited numbers of airframes that you can use to do things like fire off cruise missiles and drop these bombs. They desperately need F-16s uh, and then they need the weapons to go with them. And hopefully we'll see, it won't be an equalization, but it will be more and more of these types of weapons used against you, the Russians so that there is something at least approaching parity rather than the complete asymmetry you've got at the moment where the, the Russians are using like 30 times as many 
guided glide bombs as, as the Russians and they're absolutely hammering the front line. This then gives them the advantage on the front line. A Czechia does not support those who evade military conscription. This was stated by the head of the Foreign Minister of Czechia, Jan Lipavsky. Quote, I understand the problem of departure of Ukrainian men of conscription age. Czechia has long supported Ukrainian refugees and we accept them to our territory. But to those who try to avoid conscription duty, uh, but not those, sorry, who try to avoid conscription duty. So that's interesting. You've got all these different countries saying different things about um, Ukrainians coming to other countries. Now, as Bertolt keeps saying in the threads, you know, watch out because there's a whole morality of refugees. It's a really interesting idea as to whether people are refugees for conscription. So if you are living in Finland, could you take refugee status by going to another country in order to escape conscription. If that's not something you can do, then it, is it fair to say that both Russian and Ukrainians don't deserve refugee status in merely trying to escape what their country expects of them? It's not like persecution. It's not that you are being persecuted because you are gay or black or this religion or whatever. This is you're a man and you're expected to do national conscription. And it just so happens we're also at war. So there's a really interesting discussion around that. Now, some countries have rejected Russian refugee or uh, refugee scare quotes. I don't know how you want to label them, but people who have evaded Russian mobilization and other countries said, no, that, that's your problem. You've got to deal with it. Uh, you need to vote out, you know, vote out your government is blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I literally don't know where I sit on this. I probably need to sit down and do a whole load of moral thinking about this. Um, because it's that kind of slippery slope and you have to arbitrarily kind of say, no, these people aren't refugees and these people are. Where do you draw the line as to what qualifies for refugee status? And maybe there is an official international legal uh, demarcation about this. I'm not sure. But it probably isn't because you have different countries saying different things, which is why Poland have asked the EU to make a standard on this, to make a, a kind of declaration on this so that they can just adhere to whatever the EU says. We've seen some Baltic nations say yes to helping to send back or, or sending back Ukrainian mobilization evaders. And you've had other Baltic nations say we won't do that. So. It is it is certainly a bit of a moral minefield. Here's a downed Russian drone with silver fo is covered in silver foil that is radar reflective has radar reflective wings. Its reported uh, purpose is to be a target for Ukrainian air defenses and reveal their location to ground-based electronic warfare receivers. They have an autopilot and can access both GLONASS and GPS for navigation. So they can access a Western uh, satellite system and the Russian one, the GLONASS version. Now, we have seen balloons with reflectors floating around uh, and they are to just shine on the uh, radar system for the Ukrainians so that they go, right, let's send up a really expensive missile to blow that thing up. It's a, it's a drone or an aeroplane. Uh, and of course, it's a slow moving balloon. Balloon. Now, of course, you can try and work out with the speed of these things and whatnot. But nonetheless, it draws precious resources away. And these are look like cheap drones that are used to try and bait the air uh, defenses into and the radars into working on them isolating them, acquiring them as a target, maybe even firing at them. And then the Russians know, this is like counter battery fire, and then the Russians know where the Ukrainian radars are and the Ukrainian air defense systems are, and then they can hit them. So that's what's going on here. Right. Uh, at least 10 companies continue to export critical components to Russia despite EU sanctions. Products made by Nikomatic, a multinational company specializing in electronic components, have been found on Russian military equipment in Ukraine. So these kind of stories continually emerge in 2023 according to Yermak McFall group of international experts these companies will have exported almost 66 million euros of stuff to Russia this figure rises to almost 284 million if we include foreign companies mainly American that produce in France for Russia so these are only French companies is coming from French aid to Ukraine so 66 million euros of kit from 
uh, Russia, uh, sorry, from France to Russia, and then another $220 million of mainly American stuff going as well. Uh, according to the media outlet Disclosing for a Red Census from Linred, uh, the world's number two in thermal imaging have been found on Russian drones and planes on the front line in Ukraine. Uh, Safran and Tyler's group have also continued their partnership with the Russian army despite the invasion of Ukraine in 2022. According to the report by Arm Armaments Observatory, an independent centre of expertise based in Lyon, which is incredible that Tal's, uh, like a group that makes N laws in in uh, Belfast for the UK army and send them out to Ukraine and makes all sorts of stuff, a uh, huge defence manufacturer, is also m still making things for Russia. It seems incredible. And then finally, since 2023, North Korea has now shipped 11,000 containers of ammunition to Russia and ballistic missiles, according to top US diplomat Tracy Newell. Pyongyang, in turn, plans to receive fighter jets, surface-to-air missiles and armoured vehicles from Moscow. Also, apparently, and, and I think I've got this in my geopolitics video coming next, Russia is in return giving them fuel over and above sanctions which means that you that russia sitting on the un security sanctions is itself breaking viol is is violating the un security sanctions what is going to happen about russia doing this stuff with with north korea it is absolutely freaking unacceptable and renders the un completely pointless and or toothless come on what is going on anyway uh, that's enough from me. Just as a last minute thing here, I just want to refer you to a, here's a comment from uh, a chap called Benny, I believe, uh, reaching out to me saying, I'm a long time YouTube subscriber and follow Ukraine, fellow Ukraine supporter, sorry, and equally obsessed with news about the Ukraine war. I really appreciate your analysis, insights and philosophy. I watch as many videos each day as I possibly can, which is quite the challenge at times. I watch a few other YouTubers now and then, but your channel is my go-to as your analysis, insights, opinions are so well thought out, backed up with convincing arguments. Thank you very much. I learn a huge amount and keep up to date about Ukraine. Thanks to you. I then go a rabbit on to all and sundry in my friendship family endlessly about Ukraine as it's not as as often in the news as it should be okay so anyway long story short some days i just don't have enough time to watch your video so i've written a prototype python program to grab each video you post along with the title of it extract the audio transcribe the text word for word and then send the transcription to claude 3.0 opus ai it's a bit like chat gbt but much more capable and with the ability to handle more data to summarize it claude is then instructed to break down the content into topics along with some strict rules to follow about how to do this as well as a few tricks to get Claude to think step by step and plan out each video summary before he starts work, which hopefully means he does a far better job. If there is any aspect he doesn't understand, he's instructed to include this in his response. So this means I can condense a 30 minute video into a brief text summary with the key points, sources you mentioned and your ana 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 analysis commentary using just the audio. It's not a replacement for your videos by any means, but it is better than missing one and I can stay up to date on a busy day. It takes me about two minutes total to download, transcribe and summarize a 30 minute video. It's not perfect, but a few things were surprising, like how well it hang handles Ukrainian place names from your frontline videos. Better than me, I am sure. And it could easily be extended to summarize a whole day or week of content, create YouTube chapters automatically, or turn it into a newsletter or blog post uh, off the top of my head. Or with a bit more work and a vector database, you could even use it as a way to interrogate or summarize a topic across every video you have ever made, probably. I thought I'd mention it in case it piqued your in curiosity. Could probably automate it to send you a summary each time you post a video or give you access to it to run on demand. Not a sales pitch whatsoever, just excited to share and be able to combine my two main obsessions, Ukraine War and AI. Thanks for all the content. You do a fantastic job. All the best, Ben. Really, really interesting sounding stuff. Please let me know what you think on this and also help me understand how you think this could be useful for the channel. Uh, he said, I just found your Discord a perfect medium to publish to. I could write a bot to populate a channel uh, one set up as a thread perhaps with a summary of every topic on every video within a minute or two of it being posted nicely formatted for those short of time but don't want to miss any nuggets or as a reference for you or as a tool for you to save time e.g to summarize ukraine the latest podcast or whatnot wouldn't take long to do 
uh, to add every single video you've ever done to. You could even clone your voice and have you read it. I'm joking. Uh, that would be very wrong. Ha ha ha. I would admit that one of the first videos I tested with the AI model was the one where you covered development and dangers relating to AI. It seemed appropriate. It sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, so thank you, Ben. I'm dead interested in this. I'm so short on time. I don't even know what I need to do or how to think about using this. Guys, let me know in a thread below what you think would be useful. And don't forget there is a Discord uh, page for, for people to hang out. And look, I, I'm so behind on so much of this. To hang out and talk about stuff concerning the the channel, Ukraine War, and all sorts of, of shenanigans. So get on the Discord um join in i don't interact too much on there just because I, I i just don't have the time of day uh though i really want to and i do interact when i can um but yeah let me know about what ben has suggested that's absolutely phenomenal ben you sound like a ledge uh anyway guys take care and speak soon